then from that moment you will have a good a generative model and so you will have a good authentic detection model uh, the other things uh, for sure is the famous autoencoder uh, so autoencoders is as i said is kind of like a auto uh, like a self-supervised one and it's not predicting part of it you're predicting everything so maybe it will be easier because you don't have to think about it, it, that, a task that you should define you're just using everything so then it, it can be you can say it's universal it can be applied to any kind of data so as far as you you, ha you, you have multi-dimensional data the only thing that you want to do is to reproduce it as output so what is doing but the autoencoder uh, learns learn to compress the data from the input layer into a short code or embedding uh, 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 embedding and and then kind of uh, then un uncompress it uh, back to something close to the input so it's like you're compressing is like a, you can call it, say it's like a compression algorithm so you're compressing the data to uh, like a smaller dimensional uh, space which they call it latent space and then decompress it from it and so this will force the ae to engage in dimensionality reduction and 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 then it will force it to uh learn how to ignore some noise from your data because you you, are, you want to compress it in, in a lower dimension and still have most of the features so because we want to be able to reproduce the data again so then it will try to learn uh, some essential feature from the data. So you can actually treat it like a feature extraction from your input data. Instead of having, let's say, a thousand dimension or hundred dimension, you can, if you can compress it in 10 dimension and it's still be able to reproduce it again, then you can say, we just need 10 dimension to compress everything. That's all the feature that you need. And from that moment, even you can use uh, that uh, code or embedding of the input for different tasks as well. So the idea is compress it, and then the thing is, you can define uh, what should be the number of, uh, or the size of the code, or the feature that you want. So you can have a, you can you can try different things to see how what what would be the best number for your model. So the the aim of the autoencoder is to learn a representation or encoding uh, for a set of data, and the purpose of it was typically uh, dimensionality reduction uh, because usually. Whenever you're dealing with loss of dimension, you want to be able to reduce it in lower dimension. Then the autoencoder was the best way to do it. And even you can use it for uh, generating embedding, like word embedding, image embedding, or whatever. Then you can extract that embedding and use it for different tasks. Uh, there are lots of variations of autoencoders. Uh, the vanilla autoencoder, which basically is like that. The variation. Uh, the, the variational autoencoders and adversarial autoencoders. Uh, the variational autoencoder and adversarial autoencoder try to learn the distribution of your data as well uh, by kind of adding, let's say, uh, kind of like a regularization or restriction on the embedding that you have to learn. And uh, adversarial autoencoder kind of using some adversarial technique is similar to GANs, is a variation of a GANs actually. Uh, so using uh kind of generative uh, 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 like a discriminator models to be able to uh, learn that embedding in your autoencoder and the choice of autoencoder architecture uh, depends on the nature of the data actually so the convolution neural network are preferred for image data set while rnn based models are better for sequential data so depends on the nature of your data you can pick a different encoder or decoder uh, for, for your data so basically you can use autoencoder for any sequential data for image for any kind of data and then you can compress it and then you can use it from that moment you will have a fixed size representation of your input that you can use it so the thing is if you can compress the data and then you will to decompress it as i said the model will learn the most essential part of the data and then from that moment you can say if I use uh, the construction error as my own loss, you can say the, then then the, uh, then uh, that reconstruction can be your 
odd layer S score as well. Uh, so because, because the idea in auto encoder is like we can say get to train the A on a, on a normal data, and then you can use that A auto encoder to predict a new data once you have a new data. And then you can say normal data will produce a small difference between input and output, but abnormal or outlayer data will produce a larger difference between input and output. And the reason is because you're saying that autoencoder was trying its best to be able to compress the data and learn some most essential feature from your data and pattern from your data. And once something is not similar to the rest of the data, then the model will fail to compress it and decompress it. So that's why the output will be different from the input. And so the, the reconstruction error or residual error will be higher. So autoencoder with, uh, uh, this, the other thing, uh, funny thing about it is like uh, autoencoder with a single layer uh, with a linear activation uh, are nearly equivalent to a PCA, principal component analysis. Uh, while PCA is restricted to a linear dimensionality reduction, uh, A uh, can do linear and nonlinear uh, transformation in your data. So basically you can see uh, AE as with, is a kind of nonlinear, more complex version of PCA that can kind of redu reduce your dimension and learn the distribution, distribution of your data. And that's how you can kind of use it for even finding uh, anomaly in your data. And, and as I said, you can use it for different uh, problem, like for image, it can be C and auto encoder that you're compressing the whole image here, let's say in just 10 dimension, 10 number. So the data in this space will be highly compressed, uh, compressed, uh, and then it will be compressed of the important feature and pattern that were learned in the, in, in the normal data. So it would be the most essential part of it. And we can, then we can claim that those four player or anomalies will not fit into that scheme of the latent vector. And the abnormal part will get lost when uh, generating the output. So it means if you have a different pixel in your image, which is a bit different, because the model hasn't seen them before, it won't be able to encode it into the latent space. And when it's reconstru reconstructing it, it won't be able to decompress it. Uh, it won't be able to uh, reconstruct those parts again. Uh, so then the difference would be uh, maybe larger than the normal one. That means not only will the input output difference will be larger than with the normal samples when you have a player, you will also be able to locate the abnormal part in a single sample. Because as I said, let's say if all the image that you have seen like for MNIST, it's just a it's just a number within like in center of the image, and suddenly you have an image which maybe a corner of it is different. Is like a, you have lots of you have a circle in the corner because the all the learn autoencoder hasn't seen that before. It won't be able to compress it, and when you decompress it, it won't be able to reconstruct that part of the image. When you when you compare, the error will be high. And by just doing the difference, you should be able to see which part of the image was the one that which caused the anomaly. So you can actually find the reason or locate the part, the abnormal part in your data in your data as well. So it, it can be super helpful if you want to kind of have an interpretable, let's say, uh, anomaly detection. So the other technique is variational autoencoder, which uh, will learn which is kind of similar to the autoencoder, but it will kind of add some restriction or regularization on top of the uh, the the latent space, the embedding that you're creating. Uh, so so it, it, it kind of like okay, enforce the the latent space to be some sort of a Gaussian like a Gaussian uh, model. Uh, so that's why that's why it will help the the model to be able to kind of rep like a, to be to, it will make you to be, help you to be able to even sample from it so from it and be able to generate a sample. But the whole idea of variational autoencoder was not just be able to doing uh, uh, dimension reduction. It was kind of doing in a way that it will map the input to some let's say mixture of Gaussian. That from that moment you can just use a decoder has a new Gaussian. Mixer question based on your choice, 
and generate a new sample from it. So and the other so so it, so one of the benefit of the original tenkod is because you can interpolate with the latent space, uh, and, and the interpolation will be meaningful. So it means if you say okay, if you pass let's say in MNIST character one, and if if it map it to say that point in the space character two here, because it's it's like a Gaussian fitted Gaussian mixture on the latent space. If you move from that point to the other point in that embedding space. The output will be something, it, it will be kind of like a, if you are moving actually from that character to the other character, it will kind of change, fade from one to the other. So that's why all those nodes in that uh, latent space will be kind of like a meaningful uh, for you. So you will be able to learn uh, some, let's say, cool feature from it. I don't want to talk about rational encoder here, but that is a great concept that you can learn uh, by yourself. And I have just a picture here that, that I'm going to say that it is, uh, that as I said, they'll kind of try to learn the distribution uh, by imposing the, the Gaussian one into it. So it will say that the embedding will be, as I say, a mixture of Gaussian. So you are learning a mu and sigma, and then you're sampling from it to be able to reconstruct it. And here, so then here you can say the virtual encoder has two parts. The first part is the, the one that is actually modeling the, 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 the data and learning the distribution. And the second one is the one that will try to uh, kind of sample from it and make a new one. And that's why you can say the second one can be your judge of saying that if uh, the input was from the same distribution or not. So the whole idea is encode input as a probability distribution over a latent space and then sample from it and then decode the sample point and then compute the loss uh, between the input and output. And the cool thing here is because you're not just reconstructing the image, you're enforcing some, let's say, regularization on the latent space as well. You're enforcing it to be uh, some Gaussian uh, model. Then you can even compare these two as well. So here, uh, the uh, loss for the version of the encoder is the first, is, is, is it has two parts. The first part is the, the reconstruction error. The second part is how close is the latent space of the input to a normal distribution. So that's a regularizer. It will force the latent space all those mixture, all those uh, Gaussian to be super close to a normal distribution, which it will be like a, a Gaussian with, uh, with the average zero and, and variance one. It will enforce it to be close to that. So from that moment, once you have an image or any kind of data, you can use the reconstruction error and you can see that what, what was the latent space of that input and compare it to the, to the normal, dis normal distribution. I see how off is from the normal. So sometimes even you don't need the, the, the reconstruction part. You can just compare the, the latent space. So, or if you, wanna, if you wanna have both of them, then you will have two score that you can add them up and you can come up with maybe even better score for, for your earlier detection. So that is one of the big advantage of rational encoder for finding any anomaly in your data. The other technique, uh, is adverse auto encoder, which is actually a version of GANs uh, and is using the adverse training similar to the GAN to be able to do that, uh, to, to do the same thing similar to version auto encoder. So, so in version auto encoder, we had the input, we had the output, and for the, for the embedding part, we were kind of imposing some uh, prior, prior distribution. We're just enforcing the model to map it to uh, or fit it to uh, a distribution that we define. In, in version of the encoder, it was Gaussian. Here, it can be a Gaussian as well, but the, but the way that you're doing it is not just by adding the, uh, the loss to the, to the, uh, to the model, but just say that how different you are from a normal distribution. Here, we you, they're adding a discriminator. The, the only thing that the discriminator is doing is by saying that what is the difference between the thing that you have generated in your latent space and the prior that you will define. It can be just a Gaussian. 
So it would to, should if you can tell the difference, it, so it means if you're super off from it, the discriminator. Uh, uh, so then you can add the loss of discriminator to the model. So it means, uh, like can the discriminator should they be able to tell the difference between your prior and the latent space? So you're enforcing the adversarial encoder to make a representation which is super similar to the prior, prior that you're defining, which can be just a Gaussian. The cool thing about adversarial encoder is it doesn't have to be always Gaussian. It can be anything that you want. It can be any kind of distribution that you, that you can define. Then you can say you I, you can you can have a you can have say uh, the 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 prior can be just a circle, let's say, and it's typical things. And then you can say if the embedding is not similar to that, then uh, the estimator should be able to tell the difference. And then it will enforce the adversarial encoder to come up with the, some embedding which is close to the shape that you are defining in your prior. So then you can play with it and you can have different uh, kind of restriction or regularization on top of the embedding that you're defining. Excuse me, I just have a, a question here. Okay, go ahead. The um, prior, perhaps you said it, I didn't quite catch it, but where is it coming from? How do you You are it? defining it by, by yourself. That's the thing that you're defining. It can be just a Gaussian. You can just say it can be, it can, if you just pass a normal distribution, it will be kind of similar to the VAE. You can you can say see uh, you can say uh, the uh, the prior can be a, a number from a normal distribution with average zero and variance one would be a sample from it and so that this this will be a real data for your discriminator and you can say the the generated one is the late is the number that you're getting from the latent space and if the discriminator can tell the difference the loss will be high. So the, the autoencoder part would kind of have, it has to enforce the embedding to be similar to the prior, prior that you're defining to be able to fool the discriminator and be, getting, and be, be able to get a lower loss from the discriminator. Mm -hmm. then, then the question is, um, how do you determine the parameters for the prior? So uh, by parameter, you mean what would be the best the prior that you can define means and, and variances so that's as i said that uh, one of the good good thing about uh, adversaries it can be anything it, if you want it want it to be uh, gaussian models if you want to your uh, embedding to be gaussian you can have you can define uh, the average to be zero average to something like one or you can have because you, you others have multiple dimension you can have you can say okay first dimension should be uh, average one, Gaussian one. The second dimension should be average, let's say, two, uh, Gaussian one. So you, you can actually put some point in the space by your prior, prior and, uh, and say that the, the embedded one should be similar to the prior that, I, that I'm defining. And then from that moment, you, you are the one who is designing kind of your embedding. And if you're saying that which one will be good, it depends on your task. Uh, for them, when, whenever they were designing the adversarial encoder or AIE, their idea was how can I uh, define a better uh, embedding that I can generate better sample, kind of be able maybe to have a better uh, latent space with different, uh, if, if, let's say if, if all those uh, questions that you're defining are far from each other, then you can easily play with them or if you just pick another distribution that maybe is easier for you to, to sample from, then you can actually use that. So then, it, it, so based on your task or based on your preference, you can have different uh, prior. Here, for sure, you have to play with it and see which one is the best. And that's why I kind of prepared that aside as well from the paper. So uh, from the top one, he kind of used and a Gaussian distribution. That, and you can see he used uh, for different dimension, he, used, he, he has used different uh, mu and maybe sigma. So that's why it kind of, all of them are gathered around zero, but with but, 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 but a but different shape. For the second one, he used, he used a different distribution. So 
it enforced the latent space to be similar to the thing that you're defining your prior. And that's why you can play with it and have the, the, the uh, an embedding space a representation or embedding a presentation of your, your data in a way that you are enforcing the, the model to be like that. I'm not so, sure if I'm clear here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. So let's, basically, that's a different. You you won't be able to do something like that in VAE because in VAE, the, the definition is is all this Gaussian, and the task and the kill divergence will try to enforce everything to be close to the normal, everything be close to zero with variance of one, and then you're saying that then if you can do that, then from that moment you can say if I sample from that distribution Gaussian zero uh, normal distribution, I should be able to generate a new sample. And from us, because we are looking for a layer, we can say if even an embedding is not close to zero, is super off, even just based on the latent space representation of it, we should be able to tell the difference. Here, we can even make it even harder. Let's say if you can look at the second uh, distribution, because if you come up with a super complex representation uh, distribution, like a prior, and if you can actually fit the data to that distribution, in the, in, the, in the embedding space, then if something is out layer or, or anomaly, for sure it won't be able to match your prior and you should be able to easily catch it. And that's one of the beauty of AE. So that's why I was starting to talk about it briefly. Uh, that's, uh, that's, I guess, is a paper in 2015 from a person from UFD called Mahzani. So uh, that's a cool paper. That's you can add it to one of the autoencoder that you're using. So it's a kind of a mixture of version autoencoder and GAN. 